Okay, here we go. So 19.10, and you can see my writing on here from the last class. So the last two, the last two reactions that we looked at were in section 19.10, which were the Wittig reaction and the Horner Wadsworth Emmons reaction. And I explained how a Wittig reaction is another way to make a carbon-carbon bond. And in fact, you make a carbon-carbon double bond. So you make an alkene. And sometimes alkenes, historically, uh, scientists used to call them olefins. So sometimes this is called the Wittig olefination. You make a carbon-carbon double bond. And you do that by reacting with a Wittig reagent. Okay, so this, this uh, ilid here, we call that a Wittig reagent. But again, I told you that the proper name is an ilid. And I explained why it's preferential to draw the negative charge on the carbon and the positive charge on the phosphorus because this would actually be the major contributor to the to the hybrid, to the resonance hybrid, okay? So you have the phosphorus ilid, and then you think about that phosphorus ilid, okay? And I explained what an ilene is. We call this an ilene, but we generally, I mean, sometimes we draw the ilene for the mechanism. Sometimes you draw the ilid. Either way, you're going to get, you know, you're going to end up with an oxophosphatane and then forming... And, um, and alkene, but I think that drawing the iliad is probably more beneficial. Is that a, is that a thing? More beneficial is is beneficial to students because you know it it forces you to think about the negative charge on that carbon, and that's going to be a good nucleophile, right? That's going to attack the carbon of the carbonyl um, uh, in the cycloaddition mechanism. And here's the mechanism. I said you should know this mechanism. It's not a long mechanism. It's just a two plus two cycloaddition. So first you have the nucleophilic attack by the carbon on that delta plus carbon from that carbonyl. And then we take a pair of pi electrons and we form a bond with the phosphorus. And then the driving force of the Wittig reaction is actually the formation of this guy, triphenylphosphine oxide. And of course we produce a new carbon-carbon double bond in, in, in the process. Okay. Now, how would you go about preparing a Wittig reagent? Again, we covered this in the last lecture, but the first step of preparation of a Wittig reagent is treatment of an alkyl halide with triphenylphosphine. So triphenylphosphine acts as a nucleophile. The alkyl halide, of course, acts as an electrophile. And so since the first step is an SN2 reaction, methyl or primary halides are gonna be made into a, a Wittig reagent more easily than a secondary alkyl halide. So Again, we're showing methyl bromide. That's methyl bromide right here. And of course, we're treating that with triphenylphosphine. It does an SN2. And then the next step is going to be to treat it with butyllithium. So N-butyllithium uh, is this compound right here. We have a negative charge on that carbon. So as you can imagine, that's very basic. And that's going to be able to remove a proton from the phosphonium salt in order to form the Wittig reagent. And again, you can draw it either as the ilid or the eline. The Wittig reaction is stereoselective in that when we use a simple Wittig reagent, so it says here a Wittig derived from a simple alkyl halide, and that just means like an alkane, like a methyl or an ethyl or a propyl or an isopropyl, what have you. In that case, you're going to end up with the Z alkene. Now, that's a rule that you have to know. Okay, You end up with the Z alkene when you use a Wittig derived from a simple alkyl halide. If we have something more elaborate, if we have a Wittig reagent that has an electron withdrawing group, something essentially something that can stabilize the negative charge on the carbon of the ilid, okay? In that case, you're gonna end up with the E alkene. Okay, so here's a couple of variations. We have an ester, and of course an ester is an electron withdrawing group. Now an aromatic ring, you might not think of that as an electron withdrawing group, but I told you that it can stabilize the negative charge on the ilid. And if you're wondering, you know, what do you mean exactly by that? Well, I'm trying to adjust my screen so I could draw it for you. But if you were to draw the ilid, okay, and you draw it with the positive charge on the phosphorus and then the negative charge on the carbon like this, well, hopefully, and I, I guarantee you can, you should be able to draw all the resonance contributors where it shows the delocalization of that negative charge throughout the ring. So maybe a better way of saying it is that you have to have a group that's gonna stabilize the negative charge on the carbon. And when you have a group that stabilizes that negative charge, 
you are going to end up with the E stereoisomer. Okay, you end up with the E alkene as the major product. Now, there's a variation on the Wittig reaction, and this is a completely different reaction. It's called the Horner Wadsworth Emmons reaction, the HWE reaction, which employs a reagent very similar to the stabilized Wittig. Instead of having the stabilized Wittig, you know, having just an ester right here, it's called a phosphonate ester. Okay, so you see that instead of having all these, um, just this triphenyl, you know, or these three phenyl groups attached to the phosphorus, you have a phosphonate ester over here. Okay. And all you really need to know about the HWE reaction is if you have a phosphonate ester, you're going to end up with the same damn thing. You're going to end up with an E alkene. And why? Because it's stabilized, right? It's a resonance stabilized um, reagent. Anyhow, so there we go. Again, the Horner Wadsworth Emmons reaction is going to produce the E alkene as the major product. Now, of course, I told you that. You know, most things in organic chemistry go a little bit deeper than what we discussed in this class. And so choice of solvents and Lewis acids can affect the stereoselectivity of the Wittig and the Horner Wadsworth Emmons reactions, but that would be beyond the scope of our class. And so you just need to know what's covered in our textbook. Now, this is a classic, a real chestnut that the ACS um, always loves to ask, which is how would you, what would be the most um, efficacious route to making an alkene. So if you wanted to make this alkene that's in the green box, which Wittig reagent would you want to make? The one that's highlighted in yellow or the one that's highlighted in green? Now, I asked that question to you on Monday and everybody who answered answered it correctly. They said, well, you'd want to make the one that's highlighted in yellow, the first route. Why? Because in that case, you'd be doing the SN2 reaction on a methyl halide as opposed to a secondary alkyl halide. Okay. And so you can count on the quiz asking some kind of variation on this question. And this slide basically summarizes, you know, that if you have a secondary halide, it's going to be more hindered. And so it's not going to be as efficacious or as high yielding as if you choose route number one, where the SN2 is on a methyl halide. Okay, and we'll look at some examples of that today. Uh, what else? So here's the overall synthesis. You treat the alkyl halide. With triphenylphosphine, then with uh, sorry, n-butyllithium, you make the the iline or the ilid, and then you do the um, two plus two cycle addition to make the oxophosphatine. You generate triphenylphosphine oxide and your final product, the alkene. Again, things that we covered in last class. Well, let's take a step back a little bit. Um, so somebody says, are smaller Wittig reagents always going to be better? So it's not about smaller necessarily. You have to think about this in terms of SN2. Okay, so it's based on SN2, the preference for SN2. So it's going to be methyl versus a primary versus a secondary, and then ultimately a tertiary would be so poor that it wouldn't work. Okay, so it's just based off of um, how well an SN2 reaction will work. Okay, let's um, take a step back and look at these. Two problems here. These are some oldies, some golden oldies that come all the way from the chapter on alcohols. And that was chapter, oh boy, that's chapter 12. So chapter 12 deals with alcohols. And who could you tell me what, who these reactions are named after? We have two reactions here. We're treating ethyl magnesium bromide and phenyl magnesium bromide. Could anybody tell me the name of these reactions? It's named after a person. Be a good Jeopardy question. Very famous organic chemist who invented these reactions. These two reagents here, what do we call these? We call them some kind of reagent. Starts with the letter G. Yeah, these are green yard reagents. So this is green yard chemistry, okay? So this is green yard. Named after Vineyard, Victor Greenyard, a French chemist. Anyhow, so. Here it's just asking us to predict the major products. Now, if you're able to just simply look at the starting material and the reagent, which is ethyl magnesium bromide, and say, good grief, come on, computer. If you're able to just look at this and say, okay, well, what am I going to do? I mean, the ethyl is going to add as a nucleophile, and I'm going to end up with still having this group over here. I'm going to have my hydroxyl. 
and I'll have another ethyl group like this. Okay, that would be the final product. Okay, that's the answer. If you need to draw the mechanism, if you need to say, well, I have my ethyl, it's going to negative charge, and then I have my magnesium bromide. And if you need to draw that curved arrow to help you understand, here's your nucleophilic attack, you're going to end up producing this intermediate. Okay, so your intermediate is going to look like this. You're going to have the two ethyl groups, and then you're going to have a negative charge on your oxygen. So this is the intermediate. And then in the second step, you do a proton transfer with water. Nothing really big there. Okay, proton transfer. And then to draw the final product, that's totally fine. No problem. No problem whatsoever. Okay. Same thing if we take an aldehyde and we treat it with phenyl magnesium bromide. We call that phenyl green yard. So we can draw the phenyl with a negative charge. That's going to be a great nucleophile. And then we can start by drawing our curved arrows like this. So we're going to have our nucleophilic attack. We'll produce an intermediate, which looks like this. So we're going to have a hydrogen atom. We're going to have a phenyl like this. And then we'll have our negative charge like this. Then we're going to treat that with water. And as I told you in the next edition of this book, we changed the water to an acid because that would be more correct. Okay, you would treat that probably with some kind of buffer. Anyhow, and you're going to end up with the final product. So green yard chemistry and going over this quickly because this is, these are things that we learned a long time ago, several, several weeks ago. So some green yard chemistry, if you need to go back and review your green yard chemistry, of course, you should go ahead and do that. The next question says, identify reagents that can be used to accomplish each of the transformations shown below. The way that I think about the first one is I'm adding a carbon, right? You can see that the starting material has five carbons. There's five carbons here, and then we have five, we have six carbons here. So what are the ways that we could add a carbon? Well, if I have a methyl group that's on the same carbon as an alcohol, probably the best way to do that, to think about that retrosynthetically, would be if I had cyclopentanone, all I'd have to do is treat that with methyl magnesium bromide, and then treat that with water, and that would give me the final product. So then the question becomes, how do I get from cyclopentanol to cyclopentanone? Who could tell me what would be a good way to do that? And there's more than one correct answer. Does anybody have an idea? Yeah, David says P PCC. I'll take it, David. Sounds good to me. Let's, let's run with it. So PCC, David, I know you're the kind of guy that likes solvent, so we'll throw in a solvent. Not necessary, but dichloromethane is often used with pyridinium chlorochromate. So there you have it. I mean, you could have chosen Jess Martin for iodinane. You could have chosen chromic acid, whatever. We're just oxidizing a secondary alcohol to a ketone. The PCC works really great. It's a beautiful reagent. It's a red solid. You can weigh it out in the balance. So overall, the first step is going to be PCC and dichloromethane. Remember that DCM is the same thing as CH, CH2, Cl2. It means the same thing, dichloromethane. The second step would be to treat it with methyl magnesium bromide. What is going on here? Methyl magnesium bromide. And then finally, in the third step, you throw water on it. Okay? All right, let's look at the next one. This is another one where we're adding a carbon to the skeleton. In the starting material, we have six, seven carbons. And then over here, we have six, seven, eight carbons. And so I would think about this one in terms of retrosynthesis as well. If I could have this aldehyde, if I could have this aldehyde, all I'd have to do is treat that with methyl magnesium bromide. And then in the second step, I'd throw water on it like that, and that would give me the product. So the same rationale, okay, the same rationale applies. I'm just going to move this up a little bit, and I'm going to go with what David said before, which is he said, why don't we take this primary alcohol and we'll treat it with PCC. Now, in this case, you can't use chromic acid because that would oxidize it to the um, carboxylic acid. And so overall, in this one, 
we're going to use the exact same set of conditions. So the answer to, to the second problem, to B, is going to be the same thing. First is pyridinium chlorochromate, dichloromethane, methyl green yard, methyl magnesium bromide. And then in the third step, we put water on it like that. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's do another one. Can anybody tell me when I take an aldehyde, so we're starting with an aldehyde, aldehyde, and we're treating it with potassium cyanide and hydrochloric acid. I went over this reaction last class. Could anybody tell me what kind of functional group we end up with when we take an aldehyde or a ketone and we treat it with KCN and HCl? It's got a particular name, starts with the letter C. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Exactly. It's a cyanohydrin. Absolutely. So this is a cyanohydrin formation, and we'll draw. I'll draw it in black ink here. We'll draw the cyanohydrin. So here's the carbon where the electrophile is going to attack. We're going to have a hydroxyl, and we're going to have a nitrile. And then I'll put in this proton. So this is called a cyano, a cyanohydrin. And when you take that nitrile, okay, of the cyanohydrin, and you treat that with H3O plus and you cook it up, you oxidize that or you convert that to a carboxylic acid. So let's draw the carboxylic acid. Sha. There we go. And you end up making a carboxyl group like that. So we make a carboxylic acid. This is a reaction that you need to know. The mechanism, so the mechanism for this is going to be covered in chapter 20. Okay, so if you're wondering, you know, what's the mechanism? You could either wait until we look at it in the next chapter, or you could, you know, go ahead and look ahead in the book. It's the land of the free. Let's take a look at another problem. Now we're just, you know, doing some good practice. Identify the reagents necessary to accomplish each of the transformations below. Well, the first one, we just looked at something very much like it where we could make this carboxylic acid from a cyanohydrin. And what would that cyanohydrin look like? Well, it would look like having a hydroxyl here and having the cyano group here. Well, what would I make that from? I'm going to make that from this ketone. From cyclohexanol. Okay, and so the first step, right, the first step is going to be converting cyclohexanol, this compound, to cyclohexanone. For that, we just oxidize it using PCC. So the first step, and I'll write the steps are going to up here, is going to be PCC. And again, if you want to choose um, chromic acid or desmartin periodinane, that's totally fine with me. Once you've created or yeah, converted it to cyclohexanone, then you have to convert it into a cyanohydrin. We saw on the last slide, if we back up, a cyanohydrin was formed by treatment of an aldehyde or a ketone with potassium cyanide and HCl. Let's put that in. Potassium cyanide and HCl. And then we want to convert that to a carboxylic acid. We heat it up in the presence of acid. So H3O plus, and we heat that up. The next compound, or the next product in question B also comes from a cyanohydrin. Yes, yes it does. Okay, let me show you. If you back up and draw this cyanohydrin, so the same one that we had before, okay, Zach, and you're like, let's put this one from the first problem. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But if we treat this with lithium aluminum hydride, Lithium aluminum hydride, and if you write LAH, that's totally fine. Um, oh, sorry. Are you which reaction? Uh, reaction A of step one. Uh, yes, absolutely, because you're oxidizing a secondary alcohol. Um, let's see here. Sorry. So where was I? In H two O, like that. And so you can see that it's the exact same thing for the first two steps. And so overall for B, the first step is going to be PCC. And like Andrea said, you could use chromic acid or desmartin periodinate. Just PCC is so much easier to write, Andrea. So I'm just going to stick with that. Time is of the essence, right? Um, 
Time is money. Okay, next step is going to be potassium cyanide and HCl. Next step will be lithium aluminum hydride. We'll write LAH after I said I'm into saving time. And then the last step is going to be water like that. Okay. All right, there we go. So there's a couple more. That's some practice with some, some cyanohydrin chemistry. So cyanohydrins. So of course, that's going to be important on your quiz and on your final exam. What else? Oh, boy. Who could tell me what? Who these? Who the first reaction is named after? I guess because the, the, these are two different named reactions. But who could tell me who the first reaction is named after? Not a trick question. This should be on if not into trick questions. Yeah, the first one is a Wittig reaction, right? So let's write that down. Named after Georg Karl Wittig. Okay, so this is a Wittig reaction. Wittig, and he won the Nobel Prize for this in 1979. The easiest way. To draw the products of these is to say, well, I'm going to form my carbon-carbon double bond here, and I'm going to take this part of this molecule and add it right here. Okay, so when we draw the product, it's going to look like this. And we have our double bond, and then what do we have? We have CH, CH2, CH3. So we get CH. CH2, CH3, and that's the product. Now, E or Z is irrelevant here, right? Because this is an achiral compound. So achiral, achiral compound, okay? Therefore, E and Z are irrelevant. All right. Now, if you're the kind of person that needs to practice the mechanism for this, or you need to draw the mechanism in order to draw the final product, no problem, no problem. But if we look at the next reaction, we see that this is a different named reaction. Could anybody name this one? We went over it last class and we looked at it briefly this morning. It's kind of a variation on the Wittig. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Eric. It's the HWE reaction, right? The Horner, the Horner Wadsworth Emin. The whole idea is that you have a resonance stabilized. Reagent. And so you could draw, you know, a resonance contributor like that. But the idea is that you're going to end up with the Z alkene. Okay. So we'll put here resonance, resonance stabilized, stabilized. Therefore, um, we're going to end up with the E. Did I say Z? Because I meant E. The E alkene. Yeah, I can't remember anything I say. There we go. So what are we going to do? We're going to remove the oxygen and we're going to add this part here onto the molecule. And we just have to make sure that it's E. Let's do it. So we should look something like this where we have our methyl group. Okay. We have this hydrogen. We have our double bond. And then since this side is the bigger of the two groups, that means that this ester is going to be on the opposite side of that. So. Oops, I didn't mean to write it with a highlighter. There we go. We're going to have our ester over here like this. And of course, there's a hydrogen here. But again, you can see that the two biggest groups are E to each other. So this is the E alkene. And as I told you, if you have a really inquiring mind um, and you want to rationalize as to why we get the E alkene, I'd say it's just a shade beyond the level of what's covered in the David Klein uh, textbook. So if you want to go ahead and look at that, be my guest, be my guest. I, I taught it in the majors, you know, for a few years. So it might be something fun for you to look at if you're really interested. Otherwise, what you need to know for this class is that you produce an E alkene when you have a resonance stabilized um, illid. All right, there we go. Well, let's move on and talk about these reactions and this is the last two reactions that deal with Wittig chemistry before we look at something completely different the last reaction in chapter 19 says here identify the reagents that you would use to prepare each of the following compounds via a Wittig reaction if you look at the first alkene you know you can imagine well i would want to break it here now there's two possibilities right i could either start with i could either start with this ketone so that would be two butanone, or, or I could start with this aldehyde. 
This is called propanol or propionaldehyde, either way. So you could start with either one of those. And if you were starting with the ketone on the left, then your bitig reagent would have to look like this. It would be, okay? On the other hand, if you started with that aldehyde, your vitig reagent would look like this. Sorry, I'm not, I don't have a lot of space here, but there you go. So then the question becomes, which one of these two vitig reagents would be preferential? I'll put one in a green, a green circle, and I'll put the other one in a red circle. Who could tell me which one of these would be a higher yielding or more efficacious? If I made the one in the green circle or the one in the red circle, remember the first step is an SN2 with triphenylphosphine and an alkyl halide. Yeah, so everybody say in the green, and the greens have it, right? Give it the green light. Absolutely. So, what you would want to do then is you count the carbons in that vitig reagent. You have one, two, three carbons. That means you're going to start out with this. You're going to start out with a three carbon. Alkyl halide. So I choose, or I chose one propyl, uh, one bromopropane. You could have chosen one iodopropane, one chloropropane. I don't care. Either way, it's going to work. Okay, and you're going to treat that with triphenylphosphine. Okay, what's that going to do? That's going to do a beautiful SN2. Why? Because this is a primary alkyl halide. Alkyl halide. Okay, so we get a nice tasty SN2, and then we're going to end up with this which is called a phosphonium salt, so PPH3. The phosphorus has a positive charge. We have our bromide over here. The next step is going to be to treat that with N-butyllithium, and I'm going to remove one of those protons. That's why I drew it in there for instructional purposes only. So butyllithium in the butyl has a negative charge, so butyllithium, and that is going to remove this proton. So you're going to end up producing your illid. Let's draw the illid like this, PPH3, positive charge here, and we'll have a negative charge on the carbon. Of course, you can draw the illene, which is what I had drawn on the, on the left side of the screen anyway. You can draw it looking like this, PPH3, okay? These are just resonance contributors. Of course, we say the illid is the greater contributor because of the inefficient overlap of the 2p and 3p orbitals from carbon and phosphorus, respectively. So now, not only do we have the illid, we would also form lithium bromide, right? Because you get lithium in, in the bromide. Now, we leave those out because they're spectator ions. But anyhow, now we've made that illid effectively because this is going to be a better SN2 than if we did it on a secondary alkyl halide. So now we can simply take this illid and treat it with the ketone. One, two, three, like this. Two butanone. And then we're going to end up with our desired product, which is this guy right here. Okay? Just like that. <clears throat> and since this is made from a simple, just a plain old alkane, there's no resonance stabilization here, right? I cannot draw another resonance contributor here. I end up with what? I end up with the Z alkene, not the E alkene. So let's write that down. This is the Z alkene, like that. All right, there we have it, folks. Now, if you want to investigate, I haven't looked at the solutions manual, but if you look at the solutions manual, my guess is that he covers this one to explain why it's ineffective, okay? But again, all you have to do is show, well, if I try to do um, an SN2 reaction on a secondary alkyl halide, it's not going to react as well as a primary alkyl halide based off of steric hindrance. And there we go. Okay, the next one, you can see I'm kind of running out of space here, aren't I? Well, let me look at a, at a blank page here, and we'll give that one a shot. So we want to use Vitig chemistry to make this guy. It's symmetrical. Okay, so we're going to end up breaking you know, this bond right here. So in terms of retrosynthesis, you know, in terms of, oh, a black in terms of retrosynthesis, we're going to need to have benzaldehyde. So this is benzaldehyde. And then you're also 
going to need to have um, th this bit of creation. So uh, this, like this. So you're going to need those two. Okay. And how are you going to make this bit of creation? You're going to make that from um, uh, uh, benzyl bromide. So you would start with benzyl bromide, which is this. Okay. And you treat that with triphenylphosphine. That's going to do your SN2 reaction really well. And you're going to end up with the phosphonium salt. So, like this. Okay. Then you're going to treat that with little lithium. Okay. And you're going to end up making, oops, I just don't want to draw too fast here. You're going to end up with this. Okay, which is the same thing as what's in the blue box, right? If you need to draw that step for the mechanism, I left it out. But then that is going to react with the benzaldehyde to form an oxyphosphatane, and then finally the alkene. So you're going to take, in the last part, you're going to take the benzaldehyde and you're going to treat it with the Wittig reagent which I'm drawing as an iline instead of an illid, and that's going to give you the E product, right? Think about it. This is an E alkene. Why? Because this is resin stabilized. If we draw this contributor like this, okay, I could show the delocalization of this negative charge here throughout this aromatic ring. I'm not doing it right now, but I could. All right, there you go. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on some Vidig chemistry. All right. Yeah. And, and you know, if it seems overwhelming, again, I, as I warned you, you know, this chapter does cover a lot of a lot of reactions. But the Wittig reaction is a really important reaction in any organic chemistry class. So let's look at the very last reaction that you have to know in Chapter 19. I won't ask you the mechanism of this reaction that's shown on here. So there you go. You don't have to know this mechanism. But this is called the bayer villiger oxidation. This was discovered by um, Bayer himself and another scientist named Villiger. So two different scientists. I mean, it's an old, old reaction, but still an extremely useful reaction. And remember how we talked about, oh, you can't oxidize a ketone any further? Um, well, it's not entirely true, okay? And this reaction shows how we can oxidize either an aldehyde or a ketone by using a peroxy acid. Remember this? A peroxy acid. So peroxy acid and you should know how to draw the Lewis structure of a peroxy acid which has two oxygens like this okay but if you think about the lone pairs on the second oxygen those are localized right they're not delocalized we can't draw a resonance structure for those so those are going to make a good nucleophile and they'll attack the electrophilic carbon of the carbonyl group and then we have a proton transfer followed by a rearrangement which where you can't see it here, but you end up producing a carboxylic acid and an ester. All right, so overall in the bayer villiger oxidation, an aldehyde or a ketone is converted to a carboxylic acid or an ester, depending on, again, whether you're starting with a ketone or aldehyde. Now you might be wondering, what if these two R groups are different? You know, where's the oxygen gonna go? Can we, can we tell which side it's gonna go to? Well, the answer is yes, because the migration is going to be as follows, okay? This is called the order of migratory aptitude, okay? Um, I'm not going to write that in here, but this is called the order of migratory aptitude. And I actually did some research on this a couple of semesters ago from one of my favorite authors, um, Laszlo Curdy, a really interesting, a really great He's written a really great book about organic chemistry that I really enjoy. Anyhow, in, in that book, this is, a, this is, and I'm reading from the book. Okay, so quote, it says, factors that control migratory aptitude are not completely understood, end quote. Okay, there you have it. So, you know, if you're waiting for me to give you a good explanation why a hydrogen is going to migrate 
preferentially and then a tertiary carbon followed by secondary or a phenyl, by primary and then a methyl. I cannot give you a really good reason for that, okay? So it's not completely understood, but we do know that this is the order of migratory aptitude. And so you've got to know this order of migratory aptitude for the quiz. Now, what if we have a cyclic ketone? Here's a cyclic ketone. This is cyclopentanone, so cyclopentanone, okay? If we treat that with a peroxy acid, we get a cyclic ester, and a cyclic ester is actually called a lactone. That's a new functional group, kind of, yeah, kind of, no, right? It's an ester, but it's just an ester that's in a cyclic compound. And so you need to know that a cyclic ester is called a lactone. Now, since you just were, in, unless you read the book 10 times, which I hope you did, since you were just introduced to the order of migratory aptitude, I'm going to have this, again, I'm not going to give it to you on the quiz, but we're going to have it on every page here just so that we can refer to it when we're looking at some examples. So here, um, we're going to use this trend, again, this trend right here to explain the regioselectivity, why the oxygen gets inserted on this side instead of this side, right? And if we examine these, this carbon here is attached to two carbons. So this is secondary, right? We're going away from the carbonyl. We ignore the carbon of the carbonyl. If we look at this carbon here, uh, this carbon here, this is a methyl, okay? And secondary has a higher migratory aptitude than a methyl, and so the oxygen will get inserted there. Let's look at the next one. On the left-hand side of the carbonyl, we have, obviously, we have a phenyl. And then on this side, the right-hand side, we have a hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is the king of the castle in terms of migratory aptitude. And so when you can make a carboxylic acid, you will. So in the first case, we make an ester. And in the second case, we make a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. The bayer villiger reaction, okay? Very cool reaction. Again, I'm not going to ask you the mechanism of this reaction, but you do have to have the order of migratory aptitude memorized for the quiz. Let's take a look. It says here, predict the major product for each reaction below. Let's write down the order of migratory aptitude, which is a hydrogen atom followed by a tertiary carbon, followed by a secondary and a phenyl. Those are tied. I know somebody's wondering, are you going to ask me both of those at the same time? The answer is no. Um, then a primary and then a methyl is the loser. It's at the bottom of the barrel, okay? That, that's a greater than sign. doesn't look very good. Let me pick that up. There we go. Okay. Let's examine the carbons that flank the carbonyl. This one here is attached to one, two carbon. So this is secondary. This one is attached to one carbon. And so this is primary. So secondary. It's going to have the higher migratory aptitude. Let's draw what the product would look like. We're going to have our carbonyl. We're going to have our oxygen here. And then we're going to have our cyclohexyl over here. And then on this side, we still have our ethyl like that. This would be called cyclohexyl propanoate or cyclohexyl propionate. Either way, it's a perfectly legitimate way to name this molecule. Let me move it so it looks like prettier. Let's look at the next one. Can anybody tell me what functional group we'll get in B? Will we get a carboxylic acid or an ester in the next one? Not a trick question. This guy hates trick questions. The answer is a carboxylic acid, right? Because the hydrogen atom has the greatest, right? Highest migratory aptitude, lowest migratory aptitude. Okay, and since on this side we have a hydrogen, it's the king of the castle, so the oxygen is going to insert on that side, and we end up with a carboxylic acid. Let's draw that carboxylic acid. It'll look like that. Okay, so in the first one we got an ester, and in the second one we got a carboxylic acid. And that covers all of the new content for this chapter. The last part is simply looking at synthesis strategies. We'll go over this kind of quickly. Um, questions that you want to ask yourself whenever you're designing a synthesis. The first thing I always ask myself is, is there a change in the carbon skeleton? Right, that's going to be a major uh, consideration. And then, uh, is there a change in the functional group? See how we could take this carbonyl, we could make 
a green yard reaction or a cyanohydrin or a vitig reagent or vitig reaction rather using a vitig reagent. So these are all um, reactions that change the carbon skeleton. What else? You should be able to make a list of products that can be made from aldehydes or ketones and identify the reagents needed. Of course, all these other manipulations, these are things that were learned in previous chapters, and so you should be able to do those as well. Let's look at these problems, but in order for me to solve these problems, we're going to need more space. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So let's go back to our blank slate here, and we'll start with 19.40. Oh, sorry, I can't see. See, so 19, this is 19.40. And this is C. And the question is, we start with methyl cyclohexane, and we want to convert that to this cyclohexanol. So this would be what? 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexanol. We want to make this compound. For my students who are online right now, what would you prefer? Would you prefer that I just work it out, or would you like me to give you a couple of minutes to, to take a look at it? I think a couple of minutes to think about it would probably be more valuable than just watching me do it, but hey, this is, I'll take a vote. Okay, so a student asked, please, Andrea, whenever a student says please, I'm more than willing to accommodate them. So let's do, yeah, let me give you a couple minutes to think about it. Remember, I have a hard time not talking, but remember, this is class. Feel free to rifle through your notes, get the textbook out, get a whole library if you need to. Hey, take your time. And if you finish this one, you can move on to the other ones, which are D and E.
Okay, so I think about this problem in terms of retrosynthesis because we're starting out with seven carbons in the starting material, but we have eight carbons in this product. Okay, we have an extra methyl group here. Now, in terms of retrosynthesis, I could make this alcohol from, from this ketone. Okay, if I had this ketone, all I would have to do is take this ketone, which is 2-methylcyclohexanone, and treat it with methyl magnesium bromide followed by treatment with water. So the question becomes, you know, how do I make how do I make that ketone? How do I make that ketone? Well, I mean, we could do another retrosynthesis and say, okay, well, I could make it from the alcohol. Okay, I could make it from this alcohol. Okay, and then the question becomes, well, how do I make that alcohol? Well, let me back up and go over to the starting material. We're starting out with an alkane, right? This is a cycloalkane. There's really only one reaction that we know how to do with a cycloalkane, and that's to treat it with bromine and light. And we end up doing a substitution at, to make a tertiary um, alkyl bromide like this. And so how would we get from this compound, you know, one bromo, one methyl cyclohexane to this two methyl cyclohexanol. Well, if I could make a double bond inside the ring, then I could do an anti Markovnikov addition of water. Right? So if I treated this molecule with sodium ethoxide, that's going to pull off. The more hindered proton to make the more substituted product or the Zaitsev product. Going back to all the way back to chapter seven, alkene chemistry, and then I'd have this molecule, one methyl cyclohexene. Okay, well, can I do an anti Markovnikov addition of water to this? Yeah, absolutely, I can. If I treat this with borane and THF, followed by hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. That would give me the compound that I have written above, which is this compound. Okay, now all I have to do is oxidize this using, I'll just write PCC, keep it simple. If you want to use sodium dichromate, that totally works. Nothing wrong with that at all. And then we would end up with the ketone, like that. Then in order to get to the final product, I treat this with methyl magnesium bromide followed by treatment with water. And there we have it. So how many steps is this sequence? Step one, bromination. Step two, an elimination. Step three and four, hydroboration oxidation. Step five, oxidation. Step six, green yard. Step seven, the aqueous workup of a green yard. So this is a seven step. Okay, this is a seven-step synthesis. Seven steps. Okay, let's give another one a shot. Thanks for these uh, longer questions. This is, why don't we do 19.40D? 19.40D. Okay, and we're going to take Methyl cyclohexane, I guess we're kind of obsessed with that as a reagent. And we're going to make this compound. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons like this. We're going to have a carbonyl here. And we're going to have a hydroxyl here. Well, the first thing we should do is count up the number of carbons in the skeleton. And here we're starting out with seven carbons. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine carbons. So we're adding two carbons overall to this molecule. 
Well, if I want to go from something that's cyclic to something that's acyclic, I'm going to have to open up that ring somehow. Now, if I took this compound, and let me just show you the only way I can think of to really open up this ring would be to first treat it with bromine and light, do our radical bromination, do our substitution reaction. If you give us this, this is familiar because we saw it in the last question. Then I would do an elimination reaction using sodium methoxide. Again, I'll pull off the more hindered proton. That will give me this molecule, one methyl cyclohexene. Then here's the part where I'm going to break this molecule open. This is an old reaction that we looked at a bunch of times in the alkenes chapter, which is ozonolysis. If I treat this alkene with ozone, followed by DMS, what would I get? I'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in a row. So let's draw those out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And on carbons two and seven, right, on carbons two and seven, I'd have a carbonyl group. So here I'd have a carbonyl group. And here I'd have a carbonyl group. Yeah. Okay, now I need to figure out how to get from here to here. Well, I need to add two carbons, but you can see that you're adding a carbon here, and you're also adding a carbon here. So since I have an aldehyde and a ketone, I could treat both of those with methyl magnesium bromide. Now I'm going to do it all in one fell swoop, so we'll just say excess methyl magnesium bromide. And then we'll follow that up with water. So we'll put excess because we want to attack both of those carbonyls. S excess methyl magnesium bromide followed by treatment with water. And let's draw what we would get. And then let's really look at it very carefully. So we're going to have our one, two, four, five, six, seven. Okay. We're going to have this oxygen, but we're going to have another methyl group. I'll draw it a little shorter. And we're going to have this oxygen, and we're going to have another methyl group. Now, after protonation, we're going to convert both of those to alcohols. So this one is a secondary alcohol, and this one is a tertiary alcohol. If I treat all of that with PCC or chromic acid or desmartin periodinate, I'm only going to oxidize the secondary alcohol because you cannot oxidize a tertiary alcohol. Cannot, cannot oxidize the tertiary alcohol. And so that would be the last step in the synthesis. So overall, this is bromination, elimination, ozonolysis, so one, two, three, four, five, six for the green yard, seven. So this is also a seven step process. Let's try another one where we make a shift base. This is 19.40 E. Would you like me to give you a few minutes to look at this one after I write it down? 19.40 E. Okay, cool. No problem. So we're starting with this compound. Methylene cyclohexane. And we're going to make this compound. Before I give you a few seconds to think about it, you guys, could anybody name the functional group? in the final product. Can anybody tell me what functional group that is? I told you before it's called a shift base. Yeah, it's an imine. So this is an imine. Right? An imine is also called a Shift. Yeah, let me give you a couple minutes to look at that one.
Okay, let's take a look at this one. We're making an imine. And the only way that we could make this imine is to have, we'd have to have a carbonyl. That means we need to have this cyclohexane carbaldehyde. And we would take this and we would treat it with isopropylamine, a catalytic amount of acid, and we would remove water. So then the question becomes, you know, how do we get from this compound to this compound, right? Well, hopefully this one isn't that much of a stretch for you. That the first step is going to be an anti-Markovnikov addition of water using boron and THF, followed by H2O2 and sodium hydroxide to give you this primary alcohol. We can oxidize that to the aldehyde using PCC. And that will give us the necessary aldehyde like this. And then the last step is going to be to treat it with isopropylamine followed by a catalytic amount of acid and then removal of water to make our shift base or our imine. So overall, this is one, two, three, four. This is a four, four step synthesis. Okay. Let's continue on with our practice. And so hydroboration oxidation, this would be covered in the alkenes chapter, which I think is chapter seven. So this is covered in the alkenes, right? Hydroboration oxidation. All right. Let's take a look at some other good problems from the book. Um, this is, and don't look at the answers, right? Don't cheat. Gonna try as hard as you can. So this is 19.69A. So we're starting at the cyclohexene, and we want to make this compound. And then if you finish that one, you can try this one. Another interesting problem. Where we're starting with this gem by bromo, and we want to make an acetal. Give you a second to look at those.
Okay, let's take a look at 19.69a. We're making, we're taking a cyclohexene and we're making an alkene, this exocyclic alkene. So probably the best way we could think of to do that would be to use Wittig chemistry. All right, so if I was to start with cyclohexanone, I could take that and I could treat it with this Wittig reagent, All right? And I would make that double bond. Now keep in mind that there's two choices of the Wittig reagent, but the Wittig reagent that I've written in red is gonna be a much better choice than to make this one, right? Because that would have to be made from a secondary alkyl halide, so we'll delete that. Okay, so that's my best option. And so then the question becomes, how do I get from this alkene to this ketone, cyclohexanone? And probably the best way to do this would be to simply do a Markovnikov addition of water. Of course, Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov are irrelevant here, so this would just be a hydration. Just treating it with aqueous acid, and that would give me cyclohexanol. Then I could oxidize that secondary alcohol. And somebody mentioned chromic acid earlier on today. We'll try that for a change. So sodium dichromate, sulfuric acid, and water all together. We're going to end up making cyclohexanone. And then in the last step, we're going to treat that with our Wittig reagent. It looks like this. And there you have it. So overall, this is one, two, three. This is three steps. Give me three steps, give me three steps, miss. Does anybody know that song? I was cutting a rug at a place called The Jug. Okay. All right. So in this, this one here, we're taking a geminal. This is a geminal dibromide. All right, Gemini, because the two bromines are on the same carbon, and we want to make an acetal. This is an acetal. Okay, so, you know, in terms of retrosynthesis, how would we make that acetal? Well, we would need to have a ketone or aldehyde, and the ketone that we would need would be this ketone. And we would take that and we would treat it with methanol. Two molecules of methanol, you could write two equivalents, or you know, you could just write excess, whatever. I'll write two, and then we'd need a catalytic amount of acid, and of course, we would remove water to make our acetal. All right, so then the question becomes, how do we make that? How do we make this ketone from the geminal dibromide? Well, if you go back to the alkyne chapter which was chapter nine, I believe. Okay, if we treat this geminal dibromide with excess sodium amide, excess sodium amide followed by treatment with water, we do a double elimination and we would end up with an alkyne like this. Can we convert that alkyne to the ketone, to the methyl ketone directly? Does anybody know, can we do that? Is it a yes or a no, or does anybody know how to do it? How would we do that? Yeah, so that's going to be part of it. It's going to be to use sulfuric acid and water, but you also need mercuric sulfate, okay? So mercury two sulfate. So we would need mercuric sulfate, sulfuric acid, and water. I kind of get them written in a goofy order there. Anyhow, and what you would end up making, right, you end up making an enol. Right, so you would do the Markovnikov addition, and you'd end up with this enol, which is going to tautomerize, right, it under, undergoes tautomerization, merization which is an isomerization by the migration of a proton in a double bond to give you the, this is a methyl ketone, right? A methyl ketone. 
And then we can take that ketone and we can convert it into an acetal by treatment with two equivalents of methanol in this case, catalytic amount of acid, and the removal of water. And so overall, this is one, two, three, four steps. This is a four step sequence. Four steps like that. Let's look at one more. This is question um, 19.69, 19.69C. And we want to start with cyclopentene. And we want to make this molecule here with an eight-membered ring like this. And we want to make this. Well, in terms of retrosynthesis, I have an acetal here. So this carbon here needs to have a carbonyl. And so in terms of retrosynthesis, I would need to have acetone, this ketone, plus I need to have a diol with one, two, three, four, five carbons. So one, two, three, four, five carbons, and I need to have this diol. Well, obviously, the five carbons are going to come from here because we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. But I'm going to have to bust that ring open. And so I'll treat that with ozone followed by dimethyl sulfide. And that would give me one, two, three, four, five carbons. And that would produce this dialdehyde. I can reduce the dialdehyde using sodium borohydride and water. Give me the diol, one, two, three, four, five carbons, like that. And then I'm going to treat it with a ketone, acetone, a catalytic amount of acid, and the removal of water to form my acetal, like that. 